Hello and welcome to the Minnesota Public Health Association's Oral Health Webinar. Uh, this is the third webinar for this year in our series of on policy, clinical practice, and research in oral health across Minnesota. Today we will be talking about strengthening Minnesota's geriatric workforce using the age-friendly health systems framework. We've got a couple of Zoom meeting reminders. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat or you can save them until the end. Cameras can be on or off. And I'd like to read MPHA's ancestral land statement. This was developed by our health equity committee and that committee continues to talk about additional ways to go beyond um, the statement. We ask that you take a moment to honor and acknowledge that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe. Indigenous people have a long-standing history and connection to the land since time immemorial and are the original stewards of lands and waters. Many American Indians were forcibly exiled from their lands because of aggressive and persistent settler colonialism and United States governmental policies, but they persevered. We make this acknowledgement to honor the Dakota and Anishinaabe people, ancestors and descendants, as well as the land itself. Well, I'm very pleased um, to turn this over to Kua Her, uh, who's going to introduce our fantastic panel today, and we'll get started with the presentation. Thank you, Mary. Um, I might, perfect. Okay, so this presentation here will highlight the inequalities in oral health and explore the challenges that Minnesota faces in improving access to oral health care. This presentation will also share innovative age-friendly health system frameworks and workforce strategies that we are being utilized to help reduce oral health disparities among older adults in dental health professional shortage areas. The speakers will discuss Minnesota's dental home model, medical dental integration approaches, and community clinical linkages. We will highlight policies and support that support provider infrastructures and expand the oral health workforce while improving access to oral health services for those living in dental shortage areas. And so we did the land acknowledgement, so I'm just gonna bypass this. We want to also acknowledge that this grant, this project is funded by the HRSA, which is the Health Resources and Service Administration of the US Department of Health and Human Services. The contents that are presented are of the authors and do not represent the official views of HRSA, HSS, or the US government. And so please meet our team. We have Dr. Prashida Kanal, the State Oral Health Director at MDH, Abdir Zek Ahmed, AmeriCorps Fellow, Project Coordinator, Nicole Farian, the Clinical Innovations Director at Apple Tree Dental, and Dr. Stephen Schumann, the Director for Division of Hospital and Special Care dentistry, as well as oral health services for older adult, and a clinician and prof professor at the U of M School of Dentistry, and myself, Kua Her, the grant coordinator. And so the objective is by the end of this presentation, we hope you will leave with a better understanding of the burden of oral health among older adults in Minnesota, understand the gaps in the geriatric oral health and dental health professional shortage areas, as well as learning about the age-friendly health system frameworks and how we have applied it in real-world settings through our community clinical linkages model approach. So I'll hand it off to Rashida to discuss the burden. Thank you, Kua. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rashida Kanal, and as Kua mentioned, I serve as the State Oral Health Director at the Minnesota Department of Health Oral Health Program. I'm so pleased to be here today to share with you the burden of oral disease among older adults and tell you why this is an equity issue in Minnesota. Next slide, please. So Minnesota strives to build and protect a dental public health system that works for everyone, a system that puts oral health equity at the center. And we do this by not doing public health at our desk, but rather being out and about in our communities to really expand our understanding about what creates health. We also strengthen community capacity to help our uh, residents 
make informed decision about their oral health. And we do our best to implement health in all the in all policies in order to advance the triple aim of health equity. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, in the United States and also in Minnesota, we tend to treat mouth separately from rest of the body, a bizarre situation that Mary Otto explores in her book, The Teeth. And many of you might already know this. Historically, oral care has been separated from medicine's education system, physician networks, medical records, and payment systems. Doctors are not asking about brushing and flossing, and dentists are not talking about exercising to stay healthy. Dentistry is not just a special kind of medicine. It has uh, become another profession entirely. Next slide, please. But the body didn't sign up on this arrangement and the teeth don't know that they are supposed to keep their problems confined to the mouth. There is an important connection between the health of your mouth and the health of your body. And this is called the oral systemic connection. Next slide, please. For example, if a person has dementia, it increases oral care complications, as you can see on my slide. And, oral, and if someone has oral disease, it increases inflammation and more rapid dementia pro progression. Next slide, please. I've been uh, the dental director for over six years now, and nationally and at the state level, I've seen a lot of improvements in oral health. However, uh, many older adults in Minnesota still suffer from chronic uh, oral conditions and lack of access to the dental care they need. Next slide, please. One of the major issues why our older adults are suffering is because in Minnesota, more than 50% of our counties are designated as dental professional shortage areas. It means that we already know that over 50% of our counties do not have enough dental workforce to treat the dental disease. Next slide, please. There are many social determinants of health from transportation, cultural, language barrier, flex time. There are like many, many barriers for older adults as they are seeking care, reaching care and receiving care. Next slide, please. As a result, it's really sad to share that 42% of older adults uh, living in um, Minnesota's nursing homes have dental care need. And you'll be surprised to know that 66% of them have partial tooth loss and 25% of them have complete tooth loss, like they have no teeth, no tooth left. And 30% or three in uh, 10 older adults with fewer than 20 teeth that, uh, do not own dentures, but they absolutely need them. And this is the reason why um, oral uh, disease is an equity issue, especially when we are looking at older adults. Next slide, please. So talking about advancing oral health equity for our older adults is a very, very important now because it's a big um, issue, right? And there are several other issues that I'll share in a bit. Could you please advance the slide, please? Thank you. So greying of America is not a new thing for us nationally, but Minnesota also mirrors the same trends. We see that our older adults are living longer, which is amazing. And they can also keep their teeth for a lifetime, but they're not able to do so. They continue to work, they continue to volunteer, they continue to give back, they continue to vote, and they continue to be an important part of our communities. Next slide, please. They are also aging in place. Not all the older adults, especially if you're looking at the five ethnic communities in Minnesota, many of us are also uh, keeping our older adults at home and we are also promoting aging in place. As you can see on the slide, there is a naturally occurring retirement community map on your left. Uh, NORC is a census track where 40% of householders are 65 years. And the darker areas here on my slides are areas where we know that there are older adults living in the households. And if you look at the dental professional shortage area map for Minnesota, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, 50% of our counties already have dental professional shortages. Many of these NORCs are also in dental professional shortage area. So that's how we know that the need for dental care is really great, not just in uh, nursing home facilities, but also for our older adults who are aging in place. Next slide, please. Go. We also know that there is an increasing impact of cognitive decline. Alzheimer's uh, disease cases are expected to 
more than double by 2050, non-Hispanic Black adults, Hispanic adults, and likely uh, American Indians all are more likely to have Alzheimer's and less likely to be diagnosed. The impact of dementia on oral health has been expressed mainly in terms of the burden of the disease or prevalence, morbidity, economic costs, and inequities among racial groups. Next slide, please go up. The number of caregivers in Minnesota is also steadily rising. The burden of cognitive decline on caregivers is enormous. Caregivers play an important role in routine care of older adults and also with people, people living with dementia, but caregivers may not have the knowledge, resources, or support to, to do so. Next slide, please, go. So in a nutshell, Minnesota on average ranks among the, the healthiest nation uh, one of the healthiest states in the nation. But those averages do not tell the whole story. Minnesota has some of the greatest health disparities in the country between whites and people of color and American Indians. Health inequities are health differences among social groups that are avoidable, unnecessary, and unjust. While dementia confer vulnerability in oral health to all aging population, personal characteristics, health behaviors, and the broader social context and environmental factors independent of brain health may also play an important role. The reported lack of oral health care provision within packages of care, the difficulty finding out uh, about and accessing community dental care services, and the reliance on relatives with the knowledge, skills, or resources to make the necessary links all contribute to poor oral health and lack of access to the care. We have to understand the gaps that exist in our research, policy, and practice if we want to truly advance equity for our older adults. And I will pass it on to Kua. Thank you. So Prashida recently just brought attention to the challenges and the barriers that we have encountered by our elderly population, as well as their caregivers. And so the situation urgently calls for innovative solutions. So building upon this groundwork, Abderzak will explore the existing gaps and how we can strengthen the Minnesota geriatric workforce. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to share with you some findings I came across for uh, enduring research I've been doing for projects on the um, research that we've been doing for our upcoming projects, which are long-term care facilities, uh, uh, interviewing key from interviews at long-term care facilities and caregiver trainings we plan to deliver. So these were uh, literature review about four studies done and four focus areas were a part of this literature review and they were existing gaps in oral health care for the aging population, the barriers in oral care practices of caregivers and assisted care facilities, the competency of dental residents in geriatric oral health care, and the integration of the age-friendly health system framework into the oral health space. So these were all findings from studies that were available online uh, via databases such as NCBI and PubMed. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this first study came out in 2021, where researchers explored the competency of a group of dental students that were uh, they were assessing if they were competent enough to provide care to older adults with physical and mental impairments. And uh, they were their finding was that students did not have the required competence or confidence to provide invasive dental services to older adults with chronic conditions and multiple medication use. Uh, the study presented uh, students with x-rays of patients with molars needing extractions. And they were asked several questions that would assess their decision-making on treating those patients. And the students were, they expressed comfort in extracting teeth for patients that did not have chronic conditions. But when they were asked how they would go about treating patients that, had a, that were in a medically vulnerable state, they were less comfortable extracting their teeth and would try to refer them to a specialist instead. Next slide, please. So this study it came out in 2017, and it explored the oral health knowledge, attitudes, practices, and barriers among caregivers in long-term care facilities in Oregon. And the caregivers reported barriers to providing oral health to the patients, such as the medical requirements of each patient taking up more time, and uh, the need for, and uh, also the patients not understanding the uh, directions given to them. 
And the caregivers also expressed the need for further oral health training. And they expressed the need for training on topics such as medication effects on oral health, uh, recognizing gum disease, and recognizing dry mouth. So researchers, with the help of geriatric dental hygienists, they went on to design and implement a geriatric oral care training program that was based on the caregivers reported uh, their reported practices and educational needs. And 92% of caregivers felt the training program taught them new skills, and 98% felt they could competently apply those new skills. Next slide, please. So this study came out in 2023, and it focused on linking dental education to gerontological education. And uh, researchers mentioned that older adults have inadequate access to oral health services, partly because of an unprepared workforce. And they attributed this unprepared workforce to dental schools not having geriatric dentistry as a standard part of their program, and also uh, a lacking, they attributed to um, the geriatric dentistry not being a part of the program due to a lack of funding and also a lack of standardized curriculum. So in response, researchers developed a program called Advanced Education in General Dentistry. And this program consisted of three four-hour geriatric education seminars and four weeks of clinical rotations. And uh, their aim was to train postgraduate dental residents and evaluate the program's efficacy and advancing their competency in geriatric oral health care and age-friendly practices like the four Ms. So the final results of this study showed that after the program was implemented, residents were more likely to have the knowledge and confidence to treat older adults, and they also expressed plans to apply the four Ms in the future. Next slide, please. Okay, and this final study, it came out in 2023 and it set out to design and implement a pilot education that incorporated age-friendly concepts, the age-friendly concept known as mentation into clinical geriatric training for postgraduate dental residents. And uh, their objective uh, was to evaluate its efficacy in increasing the competence and confidence of dental residents in treating older adults with cognitive impairments. And about 15 dental residents participated in three e-learning modules, and these Modules covered mentation concerns and dementia screening, and results of this study show that the pilot education did help increase residents' knowledge and confidence to recognize mentation concerns and also consider them during dental treatment. Next slide, please. So what I want to leave you with is that the findings from these four studies, they suggest the importance of, one, bridging the gaps within geriatric dental education, and two, the importance of promoting evidence-based practices like the age-friendly health system framework. And all of this will be critical as we continue our efforts to try and strengthen Minnesota's geriatric workforce. So thank you. Um, with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to Kua. Thank you. So through the analysis, we've discussed the current landscape, the existing gap. And so now we're actively designing and implementing solutions through the age-friendly health system to bridge these gaps. However, the creation of these guidelines in the dental public health area requires the expertise of a seasoned clinician. And so this framework has the potential to change the geriatric oral health care. And our next speaker will further examine its uses and impactful possibility. Dr. Schumann. Thanks, Good. I wanna thank the MDH and MPHA for, uh, for hosting uh, this and, and inviting me. Um, as uh, our previous speaker mentioned, the, um, the, the age-friendly health system framework becomes a, is a great organizing um, uh, principle or, or framework that we can use to start to apply and translate this information to dental practitioners to help them uh, develop more age-friendly dental practices. Now, the age-friendly health system framework uh, that we've been talking about was developed some years ago by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the John Hartford Foundation and is being widely accepted and adopted uh, as, as a great uh, way to address some of the key issues that really define good geriatric care. Um, the age-friendly health system framework 
is uh, centers around the four M's that are uh, detailed on the slide. Um, the four M's include what matters to older adults, that is trying to make sure that the care we provide aligns with uh, the, the person's goals and objectives for their own life and health and, and what matters most to them. Um, the second M is medications, trying to make sure that practitioners are aware of medication risks in older adults and decrease their use of high risk medications um, when possible and also recognizing uh, in the dental office, for example, when patients are coming in and are taking medications that may be high risk that they are take, that they have decided to take as over the counter drugs or may have been prescribed by other clinicians and knowing how to address that issue. Uh, the third M uh, of the 4M framework is mentation. Now it's mentation or mind or mood and mentation. You can sort of, all of those are M's and are all covered in, um, in this concept of, of uh, what I think of as mentation or mind. Uh, and that is um, a, being aware of and able to recognize uh, conditions like dementia, depression, delirium, um, and, and know how to screen for those things, as well as how to uh, seek and connect that, uh, that uh, patient and potentially their caregivers with resources to help address those issues uh, that may be identified uh, in the dental office. And finally, the last um, M that we, that we are concerned about is, uh, is mobility. And mobility has several different dimensions, and especially as you think about it in the dental office. One is, of course, something we've been aware of for a long time, which is how do we safely move people from uh, who need help moving into the dental chair. But beyond that, we also would like dental professionals to be able to recognize individuals who may be having trouble uh, with mobility, maybe gait instability, or um, having trouble getting up, or maybe using what looks like an inappropriate assistive device, maybe a cane or a walker that doesn't fit them well or isn't, isn't helping them adequately. And again, knowing how to recognize those situations and uh, help refer people to follow-up care that they may need, knowing that the dental, dental care and dentistry is a primary care profession. People come to our offices without having a referral necessarily from someone else. And so we may be in the dental office in a good position to recognize some of these uh, problems or concerns that are of particular uh, issues for, for older adults. Um, next slide, please. Um, one of the first areas that we have been working on, uh, courtesy of grants and, and support from another project, has been the issue of mentation, and in particular, uh, the care of individuals with, with dementia. Um, this quote that's on the slide here is from a, a, a news article that was done about uh, this uh, project that we have, had been, have been working on called Dementia Friendly Dental Practices. And it points out that the number of Minnesotans with a dementia diagnosis is expected to increase by about 24% in the next five years. And so we're expecting um, about, we have about 100,000 now, we're expecting uh, 120,000 in the next five years and, and about 200,000 uh, down the road in, in the state, according to the Alzheimer's Association. So I think it becomes really critical that we start getting dental practices um, on board and able to help care uh, for the patients, uh, this growing number of patients uh, in our state and communities with, uh, who are living with dementia. Next slide. Some consequences. This is again an illustration of one of the, how we go about teaching and uh, educating dental professionals in uh, the four M's, in this case in, in, in mentation and the specific area of dementia care. Um, some of the examples here on the slide of the problems that dental offices and dental providers see uh, and will continue to see in growing numbers for people with dementia. 
um, increased oral and dental pathology. We know that people become, for, if they become forgetful, start forgetting uh, to provide uh, their own daily hygiene well, forgetting to remove their dentures, their diets may change, there may be uh, less inhibition about eating uh, sweets and sticky foods and things that could promote oral disease. Uh, people may put uh, professional dental care on the back seat and forget about that too as they uh, become totally consumed with dealing with the immediate uh, issues related to uh, dementia. Um, we also see some individually specific situations that happen in the dental office. Um, in this case, the slide shows a, a patient who had a lower left um, anesthetic injection that numbed her lower left lip and after the dental appointment chewed her lip because she forgot that she was numb and wasn't sure what was going on. Now, you know, when I was in dental school umpteen years ago, uh, this was something we were warned to worry about in kids. And in fact, my dental school had little stickers that we used to put on kids that said, caution, um, you know, lips, tongue, and cheeks are asleep. Well, we don't, nobody told me then that we might have this problem in adults, and we do see it in adults with dementia. So that's one of the things that we want to educate providers about and what to do to try to avoid that. Among the other problems listed here are things like lost dentures, a particularly difficult problem in long-term care facilities, uh, behavioral issues during treatment, um, uh, again, due to anxiety, often again, if people are having cognitive issues, behavioral problems can arise. Consent issues, understanding how to go about the consent process when we have an older adult who may have diminished cognition and may have others in their life, powers of attorney, guardians, or others who are helping in the consent process. We, of course, have to be conscious uh, of stressed care partners and not uh, continue, overburden them with, um, with additional requests and uh, and, and care instructions that might be unreasonable given the other uh, uh, difficulties they're dealing with in providing care for people with dementia. And then there are those uh, important safety issues that we worry about and again can arise or appear or be evident in the dental office uh, wandering uh, patients who are having trouble driving uh, individuals with dementia who are possibly victims of abuse or neglect. Um, we want dental professionals to be aware of all of these issues and the fact that they're in a good position to be sentinels and to help uh, identify those issues and, um, and seek help and help that person uh, as well as their caregivers uh, get the resources they need. Next slide, please. Um, why it matters, of course, and it is, you know, we've got outcomes that tell us and research that tells us that providing comprehensive dental care for older adults with dementia does improve oral health outcomes. This is a study uh, from our group here and, and one of our very talented uh, past graduate students who's now faculty at the Ohio State University, Dr. Zi Chen, who, who analyzed five years worth of data from our community clinics and compared individuals with dementia and those without dementia uh, in terms of outcomes of dental care. And he measured that in terms of tooth loss and found that in, while individuals with dementia had much poorer oral health than the non-demented patients in the, in the sample, on their arrival to the clinic, that is, they had more problems such as dental decay or caries, fractured teeth, missing teeth, that with regular treatment, tooth loss in those demented patients, the patients with dementia equalized with patients uh, who did not have dementia. And our conclusion from that study, uh, which actually received a lot of nice recognition uh, that we were happy about, was that the dentition in folks with dementia can be maintained if good dental care, if comprehensive dental care is provided. You know, getting a diagnosis or having Cognitive impairment is not necessarily sentenced that person to losing all their teeth and having poor oral health if they can get access to good dental care. Next slide. So um, 
the effort to to develop information and a curriculum around providing dementia friendly dental care, which again I see as one element of age friendly oral health care was. Uh, uh, embraced by our community and the professional community. Um, we worked with uh, the Act on Alzheimer's program of Trellis, which is our uh, metropolitan area agency on aging, um, to, to initiate this project um, in conjunction with the Minnesota Dental Association, which also embraced the project and has helped us promote this information and the curriculum and materials uh, to Minnesota's dental community. We were able to partner with the our University of Minnesota North Star Geriatrics Workforce Enhancement Program, our Minnesota BWEP that you see here, um, which also is an interprofessional group uh, that includes uh, dentistry, uh, along with medicine, nursing, pharmacy, and all the other health disciplines um, to, to develop this uh, curricular material. Uh, and of course, the School of Dentistry, where I work with additional funding uh, from the Delta Dental of Minnesota Foundation to help us uh, develop these materials. The Barclay Group, a group of dementia consultants and experts who also helped us with this work. Next slide, please. Um, so the highlights, the, the high level view of our dementia friendly dental care curriculum includes modules devoted to recognizing signs, symptoms and potential causes of dementia. Um, information and materials on how to communicate more effectively uh, with patients, care partners, and medical providers, how dental professionals can assess decision-making capacity uh, and secure appropriate consent. We were fortunate in this curriculum development to develop videos in which we demonstrate with patients who have cognitive problems how to communicate effectively how to ha um, have a discussion about concerns about cognitive impairment, how to have a conversation about the uh, to assess decision making capacity and secure appropriate consent. Um, uh, our next module is uh, devoted to patient management strategies, clinical tips and pointers um, to provide more effective dental care in the office. Um, how to develop appropriate restorative, prosthetic, and preventive treatment plans. To me, this gets directly at that what's ma what matters element of the four M's, you know, developing a treatment plan for patients with various geriatric conditions, including possibly dementia, that, is a pr that meets their goals and expectations for oral health, not ours as dental professionals and not someone else's, but theirs. Finally, recognizing safety concerns such as wandering, um, difficult driving or driving problems, abuse and neglect, and again, how to uh, talk about those things and how to address those issues with uh, patients and caregivers. And finally, how to just support dementia patients and care partners with education and community resources as needed. For example, making sure that dental professionals throughout Minnesota know that they have an area agency on aging that can help them connect their patients with the resources they might need to deal with very, with various geriatric health conditions or problems. Next slide, please. Um, we go beyond um, in, in our materials and curriculum, we go beyond just sort of teaching them what to do in the dental chair uh, as far as managing patients but also general management tips uh, in, in our case, in this curriculum's case for dementia, but what we would also do for all of the other age-friendly um, health components. Um, so general uh, considerations, scheduling issues we, we address in a big way. Communication is extremely important um, in, in knowing how to do that. And, and how to um, have the, the sometimes difficult conversations uh, with patients or caregivers about concerns that a provider might have. You know, dental professionals didn't usually go to dental school to learn how to have those kinds of conversations. Um, but when we're dealing with an aging population, uh, we need dental professionals to get more comfortable with that. Next slide, please. 
Um, part of the work we did with the dementia friendly dental practice curriculum was to develop a number of resources, including this wonderful dental provider practice tool. It's about seven pages of uh, clinical tips and pointers that can be used as a reference, a uh, quick reference in the dental office. It, it discusses issues such as uh, detecting cognitive impairment, um, how to engage in uh, con informed consent, how to have a conversation with a patient about concerns about cognition, uh, some treatment planning principles, um, and some preventive care principles, and, and, and all of those things are summarized very succinctly. And we anticipate being able to develop sort of a toolbox of kits like this, of practice tools that not only address the issue of dementia, but medication management and mobility issues. And of course, that all important topic of what matters and how to uh, have a conversation and identify um, uh, people's goals and objectives for their healthcare. Next slide, please. Um, so, uh, in the end, our plan is to adapt um, the age-friendly health system guidelines, those four M principles, um, to, uh, to make them more usable and more applicable for oral health care and for dental clinics. Um, we would use this, uh, our, you know, the practice tools and, and aids that we created um, for, uh, for dementia care to apply to the areas of what matters, medication and mobility within the context of a dental practice. And you can see listed in the graphic the types of things we're concerned about. Having good advanced care planning, knowing and being able to identify uh, what matters to that patient in terms of their health. Um, recognizing when there is under prescribing or de-prescribing needed for a patient and also avoiding high risk medications. Uh, um, that might be um, used in, in older adults. Quick example, dental professionals, dentists love non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen because they work so well for dental pain. But we also know those medications are much more risky when taken by older adults due to their increased risk of, of GI ulceration, irritation, as well as uh, congestive heart failure, blood pressure issues, and things like that that, that, that uh, non-steroidals may contribute to. So we need dental professionals to know that. Uh, we want to, of course, make sure they're not only aware of how to manage patients with dementia, but also depression, um, how to recognize uh, delirium versus dementia, um, other conditions that may affect older adults, such as post-traumatic stress disorder or substance abuse, and finally, recognizing uh, mobility issues, uh, difficulties, fall risk reduction, um, and, and trying to maximize mobility because under the 4M's principles, having people continue to keep moving is really important uh, to uh, maintain their overall health, especially as, as we all grow older. Next slide, please. I think it's my chance to turn things over uh, to Pua to talk about the next section. Thank you, Dr. Schumann. So with that, we have initiated pilot projects to enhance the caregiver training using the age-friendly health system guideline. And so the strategy aims to address some of the gaps in the caregiver support, as well as workforce training and community clinical languages. And so hence our partnership with Apple Tree Dental will help us with this with their specialty in um, long-term care facility, as well as their mod multi-model entry into the dental home. So I'll hand it over to Nicole. Hi everyone. My name, as Quinn mentioned, is Nicole Farian. I am Apple Tree's Clinical Innovations Director, and I am also the dental hygienist that is working on this project with MDH. Next slide. For those of you that don't know, Apple Tree Dental is a nonprofit dental organization serving patients regardless of insurance status. We've been seeing patients for 39 years now. Next slide. Our organization's mission is to overcome barriers to oral health with a vision to inspire partnerships that foster healthy communities. In the early stages, Apple Tree services were focused around older adults 
in long-term care settings in adults with disabilities, but the mission quickly became serving vulnerable populations across the spectrums of age and ability. Next slide. Today, Apple Tree operates nine centers for dental health as depicted on the slide. We partner with over 150 community sites to deliver care to vulnerable populations, both inside our brick and mortar clinics and then at those community sites. The red circles show where each one of the centers is located and the green shading indicates the counties in which patients come from. As you can see, Apple Tree serves patients throughout the state of Minnesota. Uh, and this really speaks to the access to care issues that Minnesota has, especially for those on Medicaid. There is a difficulty uh, for many members to find a dentist that accepts their insurance. And because we do, we see patients across the state for our general practice uh, providers. And we also have several specialists as well. Next slide. Apple Tree is known for our innovative model of care delivery. We refer to it as community collaborative practice. It is a place-based care delivered in an interprofessional manner in community settings. This model helps meet people where they're at, reducing barriers to care. Examples of community sites that we render care at include Head Start centers, schools, long-term care facilities, and group homes. Next slide. As Ku mentioned, we at Apple Tree are teaming up with MDH to implement a long-term care project. The goal is to improve oral health for older adults residing in facilities. This will be accomplished through developing and sharing best practices with caregivers, education for facility staff, as well as residents, and connection with a dental home as needed. Next slide. We will be working with two partners on this project, Lakeview Methodist in Fairmont, Minnesota, and Oak Hill Assisted Living in Grand Rapids. I'll tell you a bit about each. Lakeview Methodist is a large facility in Fairmont offering different types of care. They have skilled nursing, assisted living, and independent living. We currently render care on site using mobile equipment. I put a few pictures in at the end of my presentation so you can get an idea of what that looks like if you're not familiar with our mobile model. Because we do already deliver on site care, uh, we are able to serve the residents comprehensively, but this model will allow us to provide education to residents and staff as well. Uh, the other bonus of the Fairmont uh, site is that Apple Tree has a clinic located inside of the Mayo Medical Clinic building. So if there is a case that is too difficult to perform at Lakeview Methodist, we're able to see the patient at our Fairmont Center. Next slide. Oak Hill Assisted Living follows a different model. It is a much smaller facility and located in Grand Rapids where no dental services are currently delivered on site. Apple Tree does not have a center up in Grand Rapids or near the area, nor are there many community clinics. Access can be difficult, especially if the resident is not on Itasca Care or IM Care, which is a county-based purchasing plan. Next slide. We will engage with each facility to perform surveys, identify needs of both the residents and staff, and then create custom education in order to promote better oral health practices at the facility. Some of the topics may include oral hygiene instruction, nutritional counseling, denture care, and the education about oral health's impact on overall health. Some examples of these include for oral health instruction, teaching residents and staff about the importance of regular brushing, flossing, and the assessment of issues. I've learned that working with staff also will require education on adjuncts. Um, so a lot of these residents suffer from dry mouth from their medications or they're not as agile as they used to be. So they need a different kind of floss because they can't use traditional floss. Um, so education in that manner and just awareness for staff, too, about with the different tools and adjuncts products that are out there. Uh, for nutritional counseling, again, we uh, see dry mouth as a regular issue. And so a lot of residents 
suck on hard candies throughout the day or drink uh, sugar-filled beverages. And so the focus will be on identifying alternatives that they can use to help promote good oral health and salivary flow without uh, further causing dental disease. In denture care, a lot of education is needed in terms of how to care for a denture, reminders about taking it out at night, et cetera. And then for those who have chronic conditions, helping the residents and staff understand the connection between their oral health and their condition, such as diabetes, where it has a bi-directional relationship with periodontal disease. Um, so encouraging the residents to keep up with their diabetes medication in routines so that they have stable blood sugars, therefore their periodontal status will uh, be more stable as well. Next slide. Lastly, as I mentioned, I included a few pictures of our mobile equipment to help you get an idea of how we serve patients outside the brick and mortar dental office. So as I mentioned, at Lakeview Methodist in Fairmont, we currently have a mobile setup. Um, they've given us an actual room, so we don't have to bring our equipment back and forth. Uh, we just have essentially what we call a mobile dental office where we can bring all of our mobile equipment in. It's really the same level of professional equipment that we use in the clinic. It's just that it has wheels, so we are able to transport it uh, via a truck. So it's a great option for residents because they just have to walk downstairs and we have our own building. Uh, of course, at uh, Oak Hill, we do not have this option at this point in Grand Rapids, uh, but just wanted to get give you an idea of what we're talking about when we say mobile equipment so that you understand that we are bringing the care to the resident um, and we don't operate following a Winnebago model. Over to you, Kua. Thank you. And so our next pilot site pilot project involves training our lead community health worker in the age-friendly health guidelines. And so what we envision is that we will train our lead community health worker, who is Monisha John, Monisha, and she will expand this training to other community health workers who will expand the reach to provide education and training for caregivers in the community, as well as improving quality and increased health knowledge. And so the, t the tr training of trainer framework is an approach that we e equip our trainers with the knowledge and the skills that they need to teach and implement health programs. It is grounded in science. So trainers are educated in evidence-based practices. These strategies are scientifically validated. Um, the training prioritizes strategies to prevent health issues through education, policy advocacy, specifically primary prevention approaches. Our trainers are taught to consider the health of communities as well as po the population on a holistic approach and through a system of community clinical languages that will ensure that our, the individuals receive seamless care and support across different healthcare system. And so the training incorporates principles of equity aiming to reduce and eliminate health disparities by addressing systematic barriers to access and quality care. So who are our partners? We're leveraging our relationship with Volunteers of America and their community health workers to expand the reach into high rise communities, as well as conducting community outreach through mobile dentistry, through their use of caregiver support, the connection with caregiver support, um, their services for older adults, as well as the barbershop and beautician shops that they have. And so with everything, what is the bigger picture? So here we see the iron triangle of healthcare. Um, it represents the trilemma in healthcare systems, illustrating the challenges in balancing the three competing goals of cost, quality, and access. So within this triangle, while improving any one of these elements often comes at the expense of the others. So for example, if we wanted to enhance the quality of care, we might have to increase costs or reduce accessibilities. This tensions underlying the many challenges that we face today in healthcare policy. So in Minnesota, we strive to improve the geriatric oral health and are constantly navigating this triangle. Our goal is to increase access to high quality dental care for older adults while managing costs, which is a task that is both challenging and essential. And so at MDH, we strive to find innovations and strategic approaches to melt the boundaries of the iron triangle. Technological advancements such as teledentistry 
are expanding access without significantly increasing costs. And similarly, moving towards a value-based care emphasizes quality and outcomes over the volume, over the volume of services aiming to improve patient care while controlling for costs. And then central to our effort is prioritizing health equity. So by leveraging new technologies and care models, we aim to create a dental health care landscape where quality care is accessible to all, regardless of economic status or geographic location without sacrificing affordability. And so the vision for the future is to imagine a scenario with older adults in Minnesota can easily access top quality dental care tailored to their needs, supported by the latest technology and care practices, all within a sustainable cost structure. We are working towards a future where the constraints of the iron triangle no longer bind us. And so the next paradigm shift requires collaborations across sectors, innovative thinking and a commitment to equity and excellence. So we invite you all to join us in this journey Contribute your ideas, your expertise, and your excitement as we transform the geriatric or healthcare in Minnesota and beyond. And thank you for being here and listening to our presentations. Are there any questions? Well, that, that was a great presentation. Thank you all. Um, since you, you have this public health audience uh, in front of you, um, do any of you have any you know, specific uh, asks or takeaways that you want to make sure that uh, we as public health professionals can bring back to our communities and our workplaces? Um, what, what would you like to charge us with most <laughs> if you had to pick just one or two things? I can volunteer. Steve here. Um, first off, I'm sure there'll, there'll be other ideas too, but uh, I mean, I, you know, as a dental professional working in this area for, for many years, pretty much my whole career, uh, really, we really want all health professionals to take a little bit of ownership with us uh, for improving oral health recognizing that there are all of these growing numbers of relationships we're seeing between oral health and overall health and 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 sort of not having other folks in the health sector including public health professionals uh, recognize that that's an this is an important aspect of health care uh, you know years ago one of the uh, in the first uh, surgeon general's report on oral health in America C Everett Koop um, was quoted uh, as saying, you know, that you can't have uh, health without good oral health. You can't have overall health without good oral health. And that's true. And we keep seeing that again and again. So we really would love other uh, health professionals, including public health professionals, to realize that and try to make sure, help us um, connect people uh, with good oral health care. I can add to that. And Prashiva, I think on behalf of all our partners, our big ask is to help us put the mouth back in the body. As Dr. Schumann reinforced that oral and systemic linkages are real. So we really want help to put the mouth back in the body, whether it's through policy changes or through operational changes or, or many other things we can do together. And Dr. Schumann, I did see your chat message saying that we've been very fortunate to have such champions in Minnesota. So we want to strengthen our relationship with everybody who's working in this field so we can really advance um, or let equity for older adults. And with that, maybe Claude, Nicole, and Abdirazab, do you guys have anything to add to that? I don't, but I do see that there's a question in the chat for Dr. Schumann. Uh, and actually, uh, believe it or not, the uh, the dental material educational model that we developed was actually based on previous experiences that the Act on Alzheimer's Initiative uh, from the Area Agencies on Aging developed that was originally targeted at other health professionals, uh, including medical providers. And by the way, part of our uh, curriculum 
is a, a one one to one and a half hour sort of basic introductory uh, module or educational program um, on called dementia friendly at work for healthcare which is actually delivered by Trellis staff uh, from the Area Agency on Aging and is designed for all office staff and health and individuals. So we wanted all dental professional staff to be able to participate and learn from this, including the office staff and uh, financial people. And it also is relevant to all um, providers in the community who may be um, serving in the healthcare sector. So we do in fact have some materials uh, that we've already developed that are relevant uh, to other health providers. And there are other, uh, if you look at the ACT on Alzheimer's website, um, you can find a bunch of other resources um, for health providers and others uh, on how to improve uh, care and quality of life um, you know, their goal and the goal of the Act on Alzheimer's in initiative is to really help develop dementia friendly communities, and that includes all sectors of the community. Dr. Schumann, I shared the link to that Thank website you, in the chat. Yep. All right. Well, let's give one more uh, virtual round of applause to all of our panelists. Thank you so much for this fantastic presentation. And uh, we will send a recording out along with the slides um, to everyone who registered. And we just have a couple of uh, MPHA notes to leave you with. Um, so let me go ahead and pull that up. So well, a reminder, first of all, um, MPHA's statewide annual conference is coming up. It will be on April 25th and 26th at St. Kate's University. And uh, if you haven't registered yet, please go ahead and do so. Um, we've got links on our website and our program information. Um, CEU information is uh, getting um, up there as well. So here's a reminder for you. So mpha.net is where you need to go, not only for the conference, um, but also if you are not already a member of MPHA, we are a membership organization and we'd love to have you join us. Um, you can do that at mpha.net. And then we've got just a couple of highlights of some upcoming events. So our board elections um, will be coming up and the nomination period is open now through April 8th. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what is it like to be on our board, um, consider if it might be a right fit for you. We'd invite you to join us tomorrow, uh, March 11th at 11 o'clock for a little informal coffee chat virtually. Uh, National Public Health Week is coming up and uh, look you can look at those um, uh, events that we have and more resources. Um, a lot of our work is done by committees and so we invite you to check those out as well on mpha.net. So thank you all for joining us today and we will see you next time.